Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. You can send a donation with the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 159 13 Boise, Idaho, 83715. Uh, and you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Rocky Jordan. The original air date is July the 9th of 1950, and the title is Interlude with Lorena. Now, Del Monte Foods brings you a world of adventure with Rocky Jordan. The desert air closed in over Cairo like a tent, yellow with sand dust and heavy with heat that stayed on into the night. After closing up the tambourine, I'd stayed outside, walking downhill for a possible cool breeze off the Nile. I'd gone only a block and a half when the sound opened up. Shots came from the Sharia Namus ahead, echoing through the deserted streets. In a few seconds, I'd rounded the corner in time to see a man far ahead disappear into the darkness, and cringing there against a wall, the figure of a woman. <laughs> Are you all right, lady? Go away, please. Who shot at you? Who was it? I don't know. I don't know. Why then? What was he up to? I tell you, I don't know. Oh, help me. Her knees suddenly gave way, and I caught her in my arms just before she fell. And for the first time, I saw her face. The face of one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-liked brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world. Takes you now to the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. Gateway to the ancient East, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight, Rocky Jordan's story. Interlude with Lorena. I'd followed the sound of shots that hot night down to the Sharia Namus where I saw the figure of a man running far down the dark street and found a woman terror-stricken and sobbing. Before I could get any sense from her, she'd fainted dead away. I carried her the short distance to my cafe tambourine and put her on the cot in the office. She was every bit as beautiful as I'd first thought. Not all slender, with brown hair drawn back from her white forehead above her soft oval face. Her purse held the usual stuff, lipstick, a small vial of perfume... An identification card that gave her name, Lorena Maxwell, Mrs. Hotel Blue Nile. Her eyes finally fluttered and opened. Everything's all right now. Here, drink this. It'll help. (laughs) Thank you. Now, just lie there for a while, Lorena. You know my name? I found it in your purse. A bad habit of mine. My name's Rocky Jordan. I brought you here to my cafe. You're very kind. Rocky. Lorena, you said you had no idea who shot at you or why. You still say that? Oh, yes, of course. I don't know why anyone would want to kill me. Maybe you got to look at him. No. No, I was alone. The shots came all at once. From uh, across the feet in the shadows. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Now, easy. Mind telling me what you were doing out so late? Well, I... It was hot. And the hotel room gets terribly lonesome. I know it was foolish of me to be wandering around alone. It's hard to understand how someone like you would ever have to be alone. (laughs) You know the right thing to say, don't you? (laughs) Can I call somebody for you? No, no one. Well, then I'll drive you to your hotel if you let me. Oh, yes, I'd like that. Oh, Rocky! Mr. Bowman, open this door. 
Open it up. Uh, don't worry. It's only Sergeant Greco. The police? You're sure? There's no mistake in Greco's voice. Wait here, Lorraine. I'll let him in. All right. Oh, Mr. Jordan. You prefer to take your time. Yeah, for once, I'm glad you're here, Greco. Ah, this is the one, Sergeant Bay. It is he I saw who carried the lifeless woman into this cafe. Hey, look, you got it all wrong. Oh, so, Mr. Jordan. I have suspected you of many things, but never before. I saw it. I, Gita, who lives with his sister and the Shari Haram, will testify in the courtroom where all can hear, uh, for the usual fee. Uh, in a clear, ringing voice, I will tell all that I saw... I cut it, Gita. Nobody's dead. Enough. And where is the woman of whom Gita speaks? She's resting in my office. Come on, she'll tell you everything. We shall see. After you, Mr. Jordan. There we are. Greco. Well, where is the woman? She's gone, out the back way. That door wasn't open before. Remain where you are. And now, the truth. She was here, Greco. Somebody threw bullets at her. She fainted and I carried her here. Why she got out, I don't know. And of course, you will also say that you do not know her name or why she was shot at. Will I? Very well. Rest assured that I shall make a full report of this affair to the Captain Sabaya. In the meantime, you will do well to find this unfortunate woman. And quickly. Good night, Mr. Jordan. I seldom take Greco's advice, but this time I did. Lorena had tossed me a neat curve by skipping out just as the police showed up. I wanted some more talk with her. So I hopped in my car and drove over to the Blue Nile Hotel. A sleepy night clerk gave me a room number but said she was out. As I turned away from the desk, somebody else turned away, too, like he'd been doing a lot of listening. A pale but husky guy in a wrinkled white suit who moved too casually off to the dim side of the lobby. I took the steps to the second floor and stayed at the landing. Five minutes later, Lorena Maxwell got off the elevator. I waited just long enough for her to unlock the door. What? Well, Rocky... I was going to drive you home, Lorena. Don't you remember? Yes, I remember. Please come in Rocky, I'm terribly sorry I ran out. I was still so frightened and I wasn't sure... Sergeant Greco's real upset, too, about you not being there. You told the police who I am? No, but I'm wondering if I shouldn't have. You tell me, Lorena. Rocky, I think I can trust you. You helped me once. I've got to trust somebody. I... I lied to you. There's more to tell, then. Oh, I can't be certain you shot at me or exactly why. But, uh, sit down and I'll try to explain. Uh, sure. My husband, Paul, was a seafaring man by profession. He was? Yes. Five weeks ago at Port Said, he signed on as first mate on a freighter. The Yellow Star. Perhaps you remember about the Yellow Star at Trade Munitions. Yeah, I think I read something about it. A few miles south of Suez, the Yellow Star blew up. No one on board lived. Not a trace of anyone was found. So, Paul was dead. That ties in with the shooting? Now, wait. Paul did one thing for me before he sailed. He took out life insurance for $40,000 with the Greater Delta Insurance Company. That's a Cairo outfit. The money was paid to me two days ago. And then yesterday... Yeah, go on. I got a phone call. A man whose voice was disguised somehow said he was Paul, my husband. That he'd survived the disaster and wasn't dead. Did he sound like Paul? It was almost a whisper. I couldn't tell. He said this was his way out. He was through with me. All he wanted was half the insurance money, $20,000. And, and then he would disappear. Was Paul really that kind of a husband? Oh, no, it's impossible. We had our differences, but how could anybody be as cruel as that? It could be somebody else. Somebody trying to pick up some easy money. I'm sure it is. And yet, how can I be sure? Paul, or whoever it was, threatened that if I went to the police, he'd tell them I'd collected the insurance, knowing he was alive. So tonight was your rendezvous with him, near my tambourine. Oh, Rocky, I had to know if it was Paul. If he was really alive and if he would do such a thing. If it's just the money he wanted, why would he try to kill you? I don't know. I don't know. Rocky, what can I do? I'm afraid you'll have to decide. It's a good guess you'll hear from him again. Oh? Better answer it, Lorena. All right, are you all right? Did, did you see him? Oh, Eddie. I'm all right. Oh, I didn't know you had company. Eddie, this is Rocky Jordan. Uh, Eddie Largo. Hello, Largo. Hi. Eddie, I told Rocky about everything, about Paul's coming back. He, he's trying to help. You're passing a lot of information around. Yeah, to more than one. Well, you see, Eddie knew Paul. 
I went to him when I first got Paul's message. He knew I was going to meet Paul tonight. Largo, would Paul do such a thing to his wife if he were alive? You bet he would. I've been on to that guy for a long time. Eddie! Now, don't cover up for him, Lorena. Paul was no good, and you know it. I told you to pay him off and get it over with. Did you take the money? No. I didn't want to till I was sure. Well, it looks like my advice isn't worth much. Suit yourself, Lorena. Sorry I busted in, Jordan. <laughs> An old friend? Yes. Nothing more. Eddie and Paul were buddies once. But not anymore, huh? Rocky. I'd like to ask you to stay and talk. To help me forget all this. But I'm very tired. Yeah, sure. But watch yourself, Lorena. I'll do anything I can. I left her wondering about it all. If Paul could have escaped the blast and how Eddie Largo fitted in. When I reached the lobby, the husky guy in the wrinkled white suit was still there, moving quickly behind a palm, so I took a detour. Happen to have a match? You think I'd try in the desk? I like to let sleeping clerks lie. That's my only pack. Thanks. Are they all out of runes here? Not if I wanted one. Anything else? Well, no, that covers it. Except that bulge in your inside pocket's pulling a coat out of shape. See you around. Hey. I said that was my only pack. Oh. Sorry. Here, take a handful of mine, too. Compliments to the cafe tambourine. He didn't see the joke and watch without moving as I went out. I got in my car, sorry I hadn't asked Lorena for Eddie Largo's address, and drove back to the tambourine. When I went to unlock the alley door, I found a wad of paper shoved tightly in the keyhole. I opened it, lit a match, and made out a note badly scrawled. A Fendi Jordan. I saw more than I told the police. I saw who fired the shots. For a small fee, I will tell you and the police everything. Signed, Gita. The native beggar would come with Greco. I turned to look around for Gita, and that's what saved me. As a footstep came from behind, a knife blade nicked my ear and hit wood. But the hand held to the knife as I drove back, holding his arm and driving him across the alley to the wall. I grabbed in the darkness for his throat. His wiry frame twisted away, and the knife hilt slapped across my face. I was down, rolling away, but he'd had enough and was off running. I pulled myself up to follow, but he was gone. Lost in the black, winding streets to the north. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Here now is Larry Thorne. With all the fresh corn in the market... Maybe you wonder why I'm going to talk to you right now about Del Monte vacuum-packed golden whole kernel corn. Well, here's why. First, this corn comes from Del Monte's own specially selected strain, a sweeter, more tender corn than you could grow yourself. Del Monte golden whole kernel corn has extremely thin skins, a high natural sugar content, and it's packed almost as soon as it's picked. It's grown where soil and climate are ideal for producing the fine, hearty flavor you enjoy in corn, too. So it tastes rich as butter and sweet as country cream. What's more, it tastes that way every single time. It's dependable as the day is long. And here's the payoff. It only takes minutes to serve. And it's thrifty, too. Besides, if you like your corn kernels the good old-fashioned way in their own cream... You can buy Del Monte cream-style corn. So I ask you, when you're busy, when the weather's hot, when you want to enjoy summer corn at its finest and its easiest, why not get Del Monte corn? Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Interlude with Lorena. Well, why somebody had come slamming at me in the darkness of the alley made some sense. He'd figured I was trying too hard for the answer to Lorena's puzzle. Who he was, I hadn't been able to see. 
But the beggar boy, Gita, had left word that he'd seen who fired the shots at Lorena, and that's all the answer I wanted. I found his hovel in the Sharia Haran and roused his sister, but he hadn't been in all night. I scouted the beggar hangouts around the bazaars with no more luck. Finally, I knew it was time to put the police on his trail, but it was time. It was almost nine o'clock when I entered headquarters, and Sam Sabaya took me to the morgue below. You know who this is, Jordan? Yes, Sam. It's Gita the beggar. A knife did it? In his back. There are no other signs of violence. <clears throat> Shall we go back upstairs? Yeah. Pleasure. Where was he found, Sam? In the neighborhood of your tambourine. Now, Jordan, Sergeant Greco was led to your cafe last night by the unfortunate Gita. Apparently the only witness to see you carry an unconscious woman into your cafe. When Greco entered the tambourine, the woman was gone. Well, for once, Greco get it right. Jordan, do you not realize the position in which you find yourself by this murder? You're not saying I did it, Sam. If it is not so, do not suggest it. But always at times like this, you make yourself most difficult to find. Do you want to know where I was? All right, I was looking for Gita. And why? Well, you finally get around to what I've been trying to tell you. Gita left this note stuck to my tambourine door. Here, please. Mm. So, Gita saw much more than he told to Greco. Including who fired the shots at the girl. Find out who that was and you'll have the one that killed Gita. Indeed. Greco's report puzzles me, Jordan. You're stating to him that you did not get the woman's name. She'd fainted. I've never seen her before. There was not even some identification? Greco showed up right away. I was leaving something for him. At least you can describe her for me. American, medium height, soft brown hair and eyes, oval face. And the kind I could have kept looking at. Mm. Such a woman often provides complications for you, eh, Jordan? Let me only advise you now that there is more involved than a beautiful woman. There is also a matter of death. I didn't tell Sam anymore. I couldn't. Not till I'd found out the truth about Paul, Lorena's husband, and whether or not he was alive. So I figured I'd better check with the Greater Delta Insurance Company. A guy named Hardwick carried the ball. Oh, yes, Mr. Jordan, I have full knowledge of the Paul Maxwell policy. Number BX9421. Full coverage. Uh, naturally, I can't discuss... Oh, I'm, I'm a friend of the family back in the States. Oh, of course, of course. Sad affair. Yellow Star literally disappeared into the sea. But fortunately, Mrs. Maxwell was well protected. She got quite a tidy sum? Oh, the full 40... <clears throat> oh, confidential, I'm afraid. Oh, naturally, then. You're sure Paul Maxwell's dead? Oh, my good man, we would hardly pay such an amount until we were sure. Exhaustive investigation. The debris, the records, in cooperation with the Egyptian government. No one on board could possibly have lived. He was on board. Oh, certainly. He signed on at Port Said. I see. Who are you driving at? Oh, skip it. One thing more. Uh, who took out the policy? Why, Paul Maxwell, of course. Shortly before he sailed. Always precaution. Oh, all right. Thanks. Uh, I, I say, Mr. Jordan. Are your wife and children fully protected? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. They haven't a thing to worry about. So Lorena's story checked. Then the pressure on Lorena must have been from somebody else. But how could anyone be sure? I found myself back at the Blue Nile Hotel, hoping Lorena was in. Going through the lobby, I made a quick note that the guy in the wrinkled white suit had dropped his vigil. I decided to forget him. At Lorena's door, I got a quick answer. Oh, Rocky, come in. I tried to call you. Well, what about, Lorena? This note from Paul. It just came. Let me see. It's typewritten. Somebody's smart. At Sharia Sagan and Kafir. Ten tonight. Have the money with you. And something else is in the envelope. Yes. Paul Seaman's card. Well, something to convince you this time. Who else could have had this card but Paul? He had to have it with him. I don't know, Rock. I don't know. Have you told anybody else about this, Lorena? Eddie Largo? Oh, no. I wanted to see you first. Ah, uh, then don't. No one else has to know. Oh. I'll have to go again, you know. Oh, no, no. You're staying here. I'll find out what you have to know. Rocky, I'm not asking you to do this. I have no right to. You don't have to ask me. I'm doing this for you because I want to. Then be careful, Rocky. Please, be careful. 
A little before ten that night, I went to the place Lorena had been told to go. It turned out to be an old warehouse district above the river, dark and deserted. I found a doorway and stood waiting. A boat whistle sounded from the Nile. A dry cleaner sign flapped in the breeze a block away, and that was all. Right at ten, I lit a cigarette, cupping the tip with my hand, till I heard guarded footsteps approaching. I flipped the cigarette out into the street. Lorena? Who's there? Lorena? I'll do as good. She didn't come, then. Are you Paul Maxwell? That would disappoint you, wouldn't it? Lorena wouldn't like that either. She'll pay just so she's sure it's you. If you're Paul, prove it. All right, if that's all you want. His dim shadow moved out, and suddenly a flashlight stung the night right on me. It went off a split second after the flash of the blade. It stabbed my shoulder, pinning me to the door jam just too long as he moved in to finish it. <laughs> he twisted and dropped like a bag of wet sand. Rocky! Lorena! What are you doing here? I couldn't let him kill you. Oh, Rocky, you're hurt. Give me your gun, Lorena. I told you not to come here. But I had to. I was afraid for you. And I had to see him for myself. Well, there he is. Eddie! Eddie Largo! Yeah, Largo, your very sympathetic friend. You know now, Lorena, your husband didn't come back. And it's all over, Rocky. Maybe. I still can't figure out why Largo tried to kill you if all he wanted was the money. Well, the police came. A couple of boys took over with Eddie Largo. Lorena and I went with him to headquarters. I explained everything to Sam and how Lorena had saved my life. While the doctor took care of my shoulders, Sam talked to Lorena some more. He didn't hold her, let her go back to her hotel, and then he went down to the morgue. I rested in his office till he came up. I didn't like the look in his face. George and I have interesting news for you. Yes, sir? Lorena Maxwell did not kill Eddie Largo. I gave you her gun. It had been fired. She told you she killed him. Obviously, she tried to. However, her gun is a thirty-two. The slug just taken from Eddie Largo's body is a forty-five. Somebody else was there. If only you didn't stay to finish it. Sam, let's get out of here. No, no, Jordan, you are in no condition to go anywhere. Now, explain this. On the way, Sam. There's no time. If he killed Largo, he wants Lorena, too, and he'll move fast. Now, come on. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. Summer means bigger and better thirsts, and I hope you know the answer to every one of them. It's cool, golden Del Monte pineapple juice, the thirst quencher with the extra appeal of rich, tart, sweet, tropic flavor. Yes, and what a relief it is to find one drink the whole family enjoys so much, and is so good for them, too. Good for them is right. Del Monte pineapple juice gets its sweetness from natural fruit sugars, you know. It restores your energy while it refreshes you. And it's a good source of vitamin C besides. You'll go for its sparkling, sunny flavor at breakfast, between meals, at bedtime. Because, you see, this is the juice of Del Monte's own exclusive strains of pineapple, packed at their tropic best, just when natural tartness and sweetness are in perfect balance. The fact is, that same wonderful flavor is your pleasure in all styles of Del Monte pineapple. Sliced, crushed, chunks, tidbits, or juice. Well, I'd advise anyone with children to keep plenty of Del Monte pineapple juice on hand. They really love it. Delicious, healthful Del Monte pineapple juice is an ideal drink for the children, for everybody. Ask your grocer for several cans tomorrow. Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. Sam knew I had something, and he didn't argue anymore. We got out to his limousine with a couple of his men and raced, sirens wide open, for the Blue Nile Hotel. On the way, I told him more about the big puzzle of Lorena's husband and her uncertainty. There was still plenty to figure out, but it could be told soon enough. We made it in through the lobby, passed up the slow elevator, and took the stairs up to room 207. I turned my good shoulder, and we hit the door together. <laughs> Lorena was back, terror-stricken against the far wall, and in front of her, facing now to the door... A gun in his hand was the husky guy in the wrinkled white suit. Drop the gun. Okay. But this isn't all, Lorena. Rocky, he was going to kill me. Who is he, Lorena? He 
was here in the room and I came back. Tell me, who is he? Paul Maxwell. My husband. Sure, it's a hunch I didn't follow. The gun is a forty-five, recently fired. Mr. Maxwell, I must place you under arrest. For killing Eddie Largo? Sure, I killed him. I should have killed Lorena there. Only I wanted her to see me first. Let her know it hadn't worked. Please, please take him away. Don't let him tell any more lies. Come along, Mr. Maxwell. Yeah, sure, but don't worry, Lorena. I'm saving you for me. I'll get out somehow. I'll get out now. Come back. It's all over, Rocky. That's right, Lorena. You'll still get a husband and your 40000 insurance goes back. Well, the money doesn't matter so much. I just want to go back home. I've always wanted to, but Paul wouldn't let me. Oh, Rocky, go with me. The divorce will be easy. We can catch the first plane. Ah, uh-uh. you'd never even make it to the airport. Why, what do you mean? Why do you look at me that way? What would you say if you knew I went back to the spot where I found you the other night? That I dug a bullet out of the wall across the street. A thirty-two. Fired not at you, but by you. Did you? I'd wondered why Largo would try to kill you. He didn't. You shot at him. You didn't have a gun when I carried you to my cafe. That means you tossed it away when you saw me running up to you and then went back later and found it again. Well, Rocky, I had to defend myself. I should have told you, but... You're a bad shot, Lorena. Just like with Largo tonight. You should have stuck to the knife. The one you used on Gita, the beggar. I don't know what you're talking about. How can you accuse me? Why should Gita I... Gita had seen you fire those shots. You suspected that when you overheard him with Greco at the tambourine. So you looked Gita up. You had a big reason for keeping him quiet. What was it, Lorena? Please, I told you everything I knew. Did you? Eddie Largo sent the messages to you, sure. I don't think Eddie knew any more about Paul's being alive than you did. But where would he get Paul Seaman's card except off Paul's body? I don't know. How could I know? Try this on for size, then. You and Largo decided to kill Paul for the insurance money. So Largo went to Port Said and knifed Paul. Unknown to you, took his identification papers, then he came back to Cairo. Rocky, what are you saying? That's when you learned of the ship disaster and realized that now you could keep all the money. Largo could lump it or confess to a killing. Largo figured out a way to get his cut by making you believe your husband wasn't dead and had come back. Oh, no, Rocky, no, it's not true. Trouble was, your husband didn't die at Port Said. He knew it was Eddie Largo who tried to kill him. Paul laid low till he'd recovered enough and then came back to Cairo secretly to get revenge on both you and Largo. Rocky, listen... Listen, it doesn't matter now. You and I, we can get away. I know we can. Sure, we Just, can. Uh, sure. But first, you'll face your husband and check my story with his, right or wrong, in front of Sam Sabaya. Well, I got her to headquarters where Sam brought Lorena and her husband together. It took some blasting, but their story finally came out. Pretty close to mine, too, except for a few minor details. While Sam took Lorraine and Paul Maxwell to their cells, I went outside to try to clear my mind of all that had happened. It was almost morning when Sam joined me on the sidewalk. Well, Jordan, it's another day. Go on and say it, Sam. I was the sucker. All it takes is a pretty face. No, 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 no. It is the final test which proves the man... Once you knew the truth, you acted most wisely. <laughs> there is a strange irony to this affair. Had Lorena and Eddie Largo not conspired to kill Paul Maxwell, he would have boarded the Yellow Star and died at sea. And his wife would have kept the insurance money by every right and gone free. Yeah. Maybe then I'd never have met Lorena. Yeah, that would have been better, too. For dependable quality always, enjoy Del Monte, fruits and vegetables. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Gomer Cool and Johnny Dunkel, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jay Novello as Sam Sabaya, 
and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is The Lotus Cup of Amun-Ra. How's this for dessert tomorrow night? Frosty cool ice cream or sherbet homemade with luscious, tart, sweet Del Monte crushed pineapple. Or you could dress up a plain cake or pudding with this refreshing tropic flavor. Remember to get Del Monte crushed pineapple. Bob Stevenson speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. A really good plot, a lot of twist and uh, red herrings thrown in. And, of course, Rocky uh, gets taken by an erstwhile uh, damsel in distress. Once again, all right. Well, time now for some listener comments and feedback. Bill writes over on Facebook, Hi, uh, and this is regarding the episode Dilemma. Hi, Adam. A couple of things about this episode. First, I've noticed that over the past three episodes, the series has been transitioning the announcer job from Larry Thor to Bob Stevenson. I think this is the first time I've heard a switch done this way. Usually it's just a cold switch where a new announcer takes over without any fanfare. Although I do remember during Bob Bailey's run on John Dollar, Bailey mentioned at the end of an episode that the announcer was leaving and thanked him. Uh, and I do think uh, that I do remember that happening with uh, Bailey as Dollar. And I think uh, that particular series was a bit of a transition away from the way things were uh, done during mo most of the uh, golden age of radio. For example, you'll remember that there was a five year anniversary of. Bailey's uh, run as Johnny Dollar, which isn't something any other detective show would uh, do, uh, you know, that you would really find in other radio dramas. But it was something that uh, you could definitely see happening uh, with uh, more modern shows to celebrate five years or a season milestone. Uh, so that was definitely a transition there. He said, second, you read an email from Christie with her views on Sergeant Greco. You hypothesize that the lack of Greco during the past few months could have been either that the network wanted to distance themselves from the character or the lack of availability of Lou Krugman, who plays Greco. I think your first idea was the right one, because who should show up as El Hedron but Lou Krugman? I thought this was when El Hedron was introduced, but the climax of the story... Uh, when he gets mad at Rocky, he calls him Mr. Jordan in full Greco glory. Maybe an audio wink to the audience. Uh, that's a uh, part of the fun of listening to old time radio, hearing an actor known for one role turning up in another. Yeah, radio is really great uh, for just allowing people to play a variety of characters. Character actors did it, but some of the uh, stars, not like Hollywood stars, but... Stars of other uh, series would, you know, they do doubles, they do triples, uh, you know, just to really be a trooper. And it's something that's very efficient about audio drama. And you will still have that to that to this day on production, say, for BBC or Colonial Radio Theater. It's a medium where if you are talented, you can... Uh, really take on and get to play a bunch of different roles if you're talented enough and no one will know the difference. If you're not talented uh, enough, well, some people will know, but I digress. Uh, thanks uh, once again for the insightful comments. As always, they're much appreciated, Bill. And I do want to go ahead and wrap this up by thanking our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Robert. Robert's been one of our Patreon supporters since August 2016, and he's currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Robert. 
And that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Boston Blackie, and then next Wednesday, another episode of Rocky Jordan. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.